Okay. Today we will be talking about uh, complex uh, integration. Okay. The, <coughs> as announced in the previous lesson. So, we start from a very natural generalization of line integral. for complex valued functions. So, this is chapter complex integration. So, we have a function f, the an open set u of c and to c consider the variable to be z, okay, and the components of f to be u and v as we have already established several times. So, now we take the interval a, b on the reals and we want to define this. which means that f is restricted <coughs> on, the, on the interval, on the real axis. Huh? Now we assume that u, of course, <coughs> contains a, b. Otherwise, this is not meaningful, okay? So the natural way to define this integral is the following. You consider the integral of u of t, t plus i, of the integral of v of t, correct? So, which means that the output of this operation, you start from an interval, from a complex value function, is a complex number, if it exists, of course. So, for instance, if we assume that f has continuous components, then these numbers exist, right? Some properties, so basic facts, okay, properties of this integration. Well, <coughs> two basic properties are somehow condensed in one sentence. This integration is linear, which means that when you take the integral of the sum of two functions, to complex value functions, and you take the integral of this, this sum, and this sum means that for any t, you sum the complex number corresponding to the values of the function when calculating in t, of course, so it is meaningful. This is a, b, f, t, d, t, defined as before, plus, and this is the sum in the complex, the integral of a, b, g, t, d, t. I invite you to verify that this is true. And the second property is that when you take the function f of t times c complex number, then this is this has an integral which corresponds to c times the integral of a b f t d t. Okay, so this is left as a very simple exercise, follow it, just the definitions, nothing. And this will be done here, okay, <clears throat> because we're, then we apply again, okay, so. So take C to have alpha as real part and beta as imaginary part. Okay, I cannot use A and B because A and B are the, <laughs> in the interval, okay, this time. So, when I consider C f of t, I have alpha plus i beta v of t plus i v of t, right? Which is also alpha, sorry, alpha u of t minus beta <coughs> v of t plus i 
beta u of t plus pi alpha v of t. But for the integral of c f t dt is the definition of the integral of the real part of this number alpha u of t minus beta u of t and the t plus i the integral of well beta u of t plus alpha v of t and the t. Is that so here I also recognize that this is <coughs> c times u of t. You see this alpha and beta. This is this is a real number, and I already know that for the real for the real constants you can take out okay the constant from the symbol of integral okay because it is uh, r linear so this is true for this pair of summons and here i have what plus i then i have alpha vt and then bet beta is with a minus in front which represents also it can be re replaced by i squared so it is i take out okay if you want and i so i have i c integral of vt vt which is this is a real number this is a real number so it is c integral according to the definition we gave okay and so <clears throat> the second property uh, is proved. And as I said, it will be useful for this important inequality we have to prove, want to prove. So the, the inequality we want to prove is the following. So the integral, so the modulus of the integral, of the line integral, is smaller or equal. So this is a real number, right? This non-negative real number. On the right hand side, I put this. Which is the integral of a real value function. So it is another real number. So we can compare the two numbers. Of course, there is nothing to, to, to prove if a, b, the integral <coughs> of uh, f along the interval a, B is zero, so the, or the modulus is zero equivalently, because this is true. Hmm? But how can we prove this in general? Do you have an idea? Pardon me? The Riemann sum, sum, okay. This can be a, a strategy, but it's very long. I never, well, I never used Riemann summation, Riemann sums, to define the integral. I somehow uh, applied what we know from uh, real integrations, which means, of course, Riemann sums, OK? I think that, well, this is possible. It's very long. So the good idea is to consider, to apply, the properties we have found so far. So. We can, we, okay, this, 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 no, no. Okay, in some sense, this is what we will do. This, the same inequality, same notation, same inequality is true for real value function, all right? So, We'll restrict our consideration to the real part, 
in particular, or something with a constant in front. And then we obtain the, the desired result. But the idea is, of course, to, to use the inequalities, of course, of the real and imaginary part. You cannot use anything else. So, <clears throat> okay, as before, take as a constant this number, which I write this way. This is a complex number, correct? And theta is arbitrary, an arbitrary real number, right? And then we look for an estimate of the real part of C integral a, b, f, t, d, t. Okay, this is a real number. This is well defined, correct? And this is a real number, correct. Now, we know that this is the real part of the integral of a, b, c, f, t, d, t because of the property we have shown before. And this is nothing but the real part of the integral e minus i theta f t dt. Now, from, and this is, well, this is just replacing what we know. Well, you use the prop, one of the properties, the linearity of the integral, of the line integral, you know, of, of the complex numbers. For, the com for complex value functions, and this is just replacing C with the, this. Now, remember that by definition, when you take, when you consider the real part of the, um, of this line integral, you are considering the integral of the real part of the function, right, by definition. Remember that the real part is the integral of ut dt, while the imaginary part is the integral of vt dt. So this means that we can also somehow put the real part inside, okay? So <laughs> this is what students normally describe during oral exams, okay? So we take the real part, the real component of the function we have written here, hmm? right? Okay, now, but the real part, this is, okay, this is a real value function. And one of the first estimates we have considered for complex number is that the real part of a complex number is smaller or equal to the modulus of the complex number, right? And now we can continue by saying that, well, this is smaller or equal to the integral of And the product of complex number has a mod has modulus, which is the product of the moduli. And the modulus of this number here is 1. So that this is the integral a b f t dt. Right? Now, <clears throat> we haven't proved the inequality we were looking for so far. However, from this, we can conclude quite easily because we have the <coughs> freedom of choosing theta as we like, right? So, in particular, so remember th this is <coughs> the inequality. The real part of C times the integral is smaller or equal of the integral of the modulus of F. Good. Now, this number here, can be also written, as, this is a complex number, right? When it exists, of course, everything <laughs> is the modulus of, of this complex number times what? E i, the argument, say, arg of the integral. 
correct? If, if we use if we use the polar notation, this is the this is rho time cos say mm, mu plus i, where mu is the arc of the number. Correct. Now, I have the 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 the, the possibility to take as t as, as sorry as um, theta to be actually arg of this. So I put arg maybe the the same arg. All right. This is a number, right? This is a real number. So theta was arbitrarily chosen in the previous consideration. It, it cannot, in fact, it doesn't change the inequality here. It doesn't affect any, any change in our consideration. Now we are considering this result. And therefore, for theta equals to arg, when you take c, <coughs> then remember that here we have this. Huh? So this is e minus i theta integral, sorry, modulus times e i theta, if theta is this, right? So this cancels this because they are one, the inverse of the other, and then we have the inequality. The inequality. We have <coughs> the inequality. Right? And this will be very important for many estimates. Now, the next step is to consider, instead of an interval, a piecewise continuous, at least, path in the plane, which is the natural extension and generalization of the interval. So consider gamma to be piecewise Assume that it is differentiable, okay? Curve in season. So we have that gamma is defined in an open set of the reals and takes its values in C and it is well sufficiently regular except for some odd points, okay? So here you have the tangent vector in the real sense, okay? Uh, but here, of course, this is a corner point, okay? <laughs> now assume that, well, gamma of A, B is contained in uh, U and F is a complex value function taking it, valid, so defined in U. So then we can consider F of gamma of T, of course. Huh? So the composition is well defined, and it turns out that this composition is a function from the interval into the complex plane. So we define the integral over gamma of F, Z, and of course Z is the variable now, so I have to put DZ here because we are integrating in, in the complex plane. This turns out to be, by definition, the integral of this function here, call it, if you want, g of t, with respect to t, correct? So the integral is in <coughs> between a and b because gamma was defined. So it is, it is reduced to a line integral again. 
But of course, we have to take into consideration that we have gamma here as new variable, so we have a change of variable, so it is properly considered and the new change in a new variable. So this is a line integral and this is an extend an extension for nothing new. Okay. Of course <coughs> I believe you are all familiar with this stuff. We can also make another change of variables. You can take another variable tau, for instance, uh, and the change of variable between t and tau, the interval, has to be, of course, a change of variable. So it has to be a monotone increasing function, right? And you can substitute one into the other and take into consideration this fact without great efforts, I guess, because it is essentially real integration. What we observe as a consequence from the definition is that, well, you have like for the interval, since the interval is a subset of R, similarly the curve, the curve gamma, has um, uh, so, so yeah, in, in, and on the curve you have the same orientation of the interval. So you start moving from the point gamma of A and you reach the point gamma of B. Since T is increasing between A and B, you imagine that the point is moving from gamma A into gamma B. So there is a preferred sense of, of uh, on the curve gamma. And what is natural to do is, well, if you reverse this sense, this order, uh, well, you, you put a minus one in front. So, so what is natural to use as a notation is the following. So you take minus gamma with the convention that this means the same set of points, but the curve is, okay, starting from B and moving. So if you want, it is reparameterized in such a way that gamma of T uh, so, sorry, so gamma tilde of t is gamma of, uh, how can I write it? It could be minus t, but this is not them. B, B, B plus, uh, when it is zero, right? So B t a, sorry, one minus t, right? Is that, so t is zero, this is, no. Anyhow, you know what I mean. You know, we have, say, assume just one piece, and this is gamma of A, and this is gamma of B, right? So we move from A into B on the parameter set T here, and this way. Then we start from here and move back to here, so that. The point is that the, this interval is not zero one, okay? <laughs> so t is not moving, okay? It's like, uh, okay, probably it's like this, a minus t, sorry. It is, uh, sorry. Anyhow, with minus gamma, I mean the same, the same uh, function, but you take the opposite orientation on the interval, okay? So with this, in mind, and remembering what happens for the real integration. Hmm? So if you reverse the endpoints of the interval, which is what we have done, right? <coughs> you obtain the opposite of the interval, okay? And that's, that's what uh, we have also in the case, case of comp. We also have the possibility to join different path. You can have gamma, then take uh, eta and so on, or gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 1, gamma 3, and so on and so forth. Hmm? And if you imagine that the end point of gamma j is, the, is uh, the same as the starting point of gamma j plus 1, okay, you in fact have a collection of pieces, or if you want more in general, you take gamma to be the union of gamma j's, 
and the integral of gamma of f, sorry, fz, here is fz, sorry, fz, right, fz dz is summation of the integral over gamma j of fz dz, right? Bob notation, which is also important to, to recall, we use dz sorry, this is seven. So remember the z was normally <coughs> written as x plus i y. Right? So what is dz? Well dz is if you want by definition is this. If you want by definition, but this can be also obtained, because imagine that this point here depends on t. This is x of t plus i y of t, right? So if you take the derivative with respect to t, then you take the differential, okay? You have the dz of t, right, over dt dt is dz, right? That's how dz of t over dt is dx of t over dt plus i dy of t over dt, which means that dz is dx plus i dy. And similar dz bar, dz bar is the, this is a called form, right? This is the form with the minus in front of i, okay? Which can be considered as formally as the conjugate of the previous, con or the previous form. Now, what do we mean by considering this? The integral of a gamma, not with respect to z, but of dz bar. <laughs> this has to be defined or to be calculated, right? Well, <clears throat> if you replace everything in this in this um, notation, this is the, the conjugate of the integral of the conjugate. Just verify if you want. Right? Now, we have also the possibility to express the integral over gamma of fz dx. Well, dx is related to dz in this way, right? Plus i dy. And remember, dz bar is dx minus i dy. And this is one half the integral over gamma fz dz plus the integral over gamma of fz dz bar. Pardon me? On the here? Fz of dx. Okay? No, that's what I'm saying. Right? So this can be expressed in terms of the integral, the integrals we have defined so far. So I invite you also to, to, to write this. Okay. This is a matter of notation we have we are done. I guess so. Now, <clears throat> remember that <clears throat> f of z is normally considered as a function of u and v, depending on z, right? Therefore, I can also use this expression.
to calculate and, and dz is dx plus i dy. Correct? So that I can reduce again to some stuff which is more real than, than the other, okay? The, in, the other, in the other definitions, the, it is intrinsic, it is complex, but then you use the line integral, it, it becomes real. But, well, it has to have also a counterpart here. Let's see. This is, after some modification uh, from obvious calculation, it is uz minus vz Correct, so you use the dx. Okay, the x and the y, correct? Yes. Plus i integral <coughs> over gamma uh, vz dx plus. Why? Well, nine, which means that we can also consider the integral of a gamma of fz dz to be expressed in this way, the integral of a gamma of a function p of z dx plus of q of z dy. Of course, z is x plus i and y. And if you want to be more precise, I use this. equivalent expression. So this is a, uh, a complex value function depending on x and y, and I integrate with respect to dx plus i, something else, similar. So it's up to you in some sense. You can define this integral either by considering this, which is also something meaningful in the real, in the, in the sense of the real integration, or use the other oppos opposite, not opposite, but equivalent, okay, statement. Now, what is well known, I guess, and in the, in the real uh, integration theory is the following. So, assume that we want to prove Uh, I can also, well, this is i, right? Yes, but I can put inside, I call it q tilde, okay? And put it in a semi integral. This is i because, well, it's not so important, but I can put i in front of q, right? And I want to say something about the possibility to, um, to, 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 to express this integral without taking into consideration the path, but only the endpoints of the path. Okay, this is quite, uh, say, a standard um, result in uh, plain uh, or in, say, in a real an analysis with more than one variable. And you ask, well, is it true that if you take the integral along a curve, gamma, this integral has the same value if you take a, a curve, the integral over another curve with the same starting and ending point. Is it always the case? No, it is not. And it's, it can be characterized, okay? It is also a physical interpretation, okay? Yes, conservative fields are related to this. Okay, do you have an example of con conservative fields? Gravitation, good. Electric field, 
Yes, good. So in physics, this is applied several times. And it has equivalent, <coughs> uh, can be expressed in equivalent ways. So the integral n does not depend on gamma, but only on the endpoints. Or the integral over closed curve, which means that the endpoint is uh, the same as the starting point, the integral over the over a closed curve is zero. Hmm? But th this all <coughs> is characterized in the following way. So let me change and say the following number ten. So I have that. depends only let me say on the endpoints of gamma Just gamma a and gamma b but not on gamma that is to say i have gamma A here, gamma B here. This is gamma. If I replace gamma with another curve, sigma with the same starting point, so such that sigma of A is gamma A, sigma of B is gamma B, and then the integral over gamma of F, sorry, of P dx plus Q dy is the integral over sigma of P dx plus Q dy. Okay? If and only if there exists function, say capital U, such that U is differentiable and U has derivative with respect to x equal to p and derivative of U with respect to y is q. This is a theorem. In an equivalent way, in many books, especially in standard mechanical, again, sorry, standard classical books from mechanics, from so standard calculus, this is also <coughs> summarized by saying that this form here, p dx plus q dy, is an exact differential. Okay, so every time you have a function like this. In physics, it assumes the, the role of a potential, okay? So if you want to, to rephrase the statement once you, this theorem is proved that the, in terms of physical uh, interpretation, say, the field is conservative if and only if, if it has a potential, correct? Let's see how this proof goes. This is a sketch of the proof, right? Are you familiar with this stuff? Is it something you already know? Yes, I hope so. Now, let's see. OK, you never heard this word. Well, this is just a word. In, uh, in in physics, it means, well, you have a function with this property. Okay? We are ma mathematicians, so we prefer to define it in terms of the partial derivatives and so on. But it has a meaning. Okay? So if you want, to, you have a field, and this, mm, this field, so to say, for instance, to move an object from here to here, you have to make some work, right? You have to spend some energy. But well, this rubber now has increased its potential, gravitational potential. So I, my 
my muscle here work against the gravitational. Okay, so I'm doing some work. And this object here achieves the potential. In fact, it falls down. Okay, so this is in potential the energy, and this is the energy spent. And when it arrives here, all the energy, the potential energy, the gravitational energy is spent. Well, when it is moving, part is still gravitational, and part is cinematic, right? So, sorry, is kinetic, kinetic, huh? Okay, energy, because it moves. So when it hits, it hurts. Okay, but it has energy. When finally it arrives here, so so consider this as a level zero for our consideration, okay, you can uh, rescale everything. So the energy, the potential energy is zero, but also it, it does, it, this object is not moving. So the entire energy is absorbed in terms of uh, internal energy, so in essentially in heat energy. Huh? Okay? But it's just a name, right? So we now consider more uh, abstract aspect. So we have to consider once uh, you have a function with this property, the integral, and prove that this integral does not depend on the curve. Vice versa, if you assume that the, 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 the integral does not depend on the curve, but only on the endpoints, we will so construct a function u with these properties. And that's what will be very important for our consider future consideration. Okay. Let me continue. So this is <clears throat> so assume that we have u. Okay. Of course, to be very formal, I have to specify where it exists. Of course, we have to assume that the function u has to have derivatives, so partial derivatives with respect to x and to y. Okay? Now, the integral of a gamma of p dx plus q dy is then replaced with the integral of du over dx dx plus du dy dy. And this is, by definition, the integral over a b becomes a line integral, right? Mm -hmm. Of du dx x prime of t dt plus du dy y prime of t dt, which is also the integral to a b du dx x prime of t plus du dy y prime of t dt, which is also by definition the derivative of u with respect to t, when u is restricted along the curve x t y t. So from very basic calculus, this when you have here an expression which is the derivative of a function, well, this is nothing but u of x b y b minus u of x a y b y b y a. Sorry. <coughs> Which means that what is important is to consider the starting and the end point, evaluate this potential there, consider the difference, but not the curve. So this number here is independent of the choice of the curve, but depends only on the end points of the curve. Vice versa.
So assume that the integral does not depend on gamma, but only on gamma A and gamma B. Huh? With some of using notation, uh, I said that, well, x and y are, in fact, the components of gamma, if you want, OK? When you restrict on the interval a, b, gamma of t is x of t, y of t, which varies, OK? In the previous slide, I used this. OK, I assume that this is a natural way to indicate. If you want, you can say, well, gamma of t is, in fact, x t plus i y t. But then, as usual, this is identified with the pair x t y t in the plane R2 we are considering, which is probably more familiar to you huh, to work with. So now, <coughs> now let me make a small, uh, so we have here our set omega where functions are defined, everything works fine. And we have this end point here, right? Gamma of b, and here gamma of a. So we can choose any curve connecting gamma uh, a to gamma b. And the, if, the, if the, 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 the curve is uh, piecewise differentiable and so on, the integral is defined independent of the curve, because this is our assumption. Okay? So the curve has to have some regularity, but for the rest, it doesn't really uh, give any effect on the value of the integral. So in particular, we can assume that, well, uh, as a, a curve, we take a, a, po um, a polygonal path connecting these two points with uh, um, segments parallel to the axis. Okay, this is in the Gauss plane. Assume that this is x and this is y. So in particular, we take a polygonal path like this, okay, for instance. And then another one is like this. Or more sophisticated stairs. Sorry. Okay. So assume that the, well, and, and, and uh, the choice is completely arbitrary. Now assume that um, we consider a polygonal path with the last segment parallel to x axis. Which means that y is fixed in the last part, right? So and we can keep y constant on the last segment if it is parallel to its axis. <clears throat> now we define u of x, y to be the integral <laughs> of uh, any, say, say this point is, uh, what rotation used here? Um, okay, x, b, y, b, 
gamma of p x y dx plus q x y dy, where gamma is polygonal path. Okay, the choice of the polygonal path is just because we want to prove the second property of u. But u is well defined. You take, you take so I state, start from one point, and you define the function capital U in the following way. Take any curve, not necessarily polygonal, but for our consideration it's useful, okay, which connects the starting, any starting point in gamma to this point and consider the integral. Since the integral is independent on the curve but only on the end points, okay, this function is well defined. Okay. Just to, to come back to the previous example, the, the starting point is equivalent to the, the side in this stupid example <laughs> to decide where the potential is zero. It's just to rescale. Okay, I decided that this is the starting point. So, for instance, at that point, the function u of uh, is zero. The potential is zero. When you change the starting point, you have another potential. Okay? Correct? So, for instance, this is zero for my consideration. It's not zero if I, if I take this point here, right? This level here is level. Good. So, in the last, in the last segment, what we do have is the following. Y is constant and C is moving so that U of X, Y in the last segment is something like depending on X only, P, X, Y, DX plus a constant because Y is constant to some plus something where from this if you just move x then you have an integral over x of something well the derivative is just the integral function and similarly since you, the, the choice of the curve is completely arbitrary you can also con to join the same point starting and ending point with the, a polygonal path with a vertical segment at the end, and you obtain the analogous Yes, please. No. No, no, no. This is a constant. Yes, we just define x. This constant define to dx. 2x not probably, but when then you take the derivative is not depending on x. No. Okay. Let me let me say it again. Probably to have, it's uh, worth saying a few words. So uh, we are in gamma. This is a starting point. Call it z naught gamma of a. Okay, and then we connect this point z in gamma of B using this segment in the last part okay, of the polygon. Up to here, when you have another, say, or something like this, but you can take whatever you want. Okay, the value of this integral is given and depends only on this point here. Correct? Because we are assuming so. So when you actually consider the last part, of the polygonal path. It depends only on x, not on y, but the constant here depends on this value here, and it is independent on x. It's a constant number, so which represents what, if you want, using again the example, which represents the, the work you have done up to a certain level, okay? Then you add something new. Here it's, one, it's only one parameter you can choose, okay? <laughs> But we have two parameters in our example. So the constant I, I used, I used, I indicated here, is what you have done up to this point, where the the last segment, the horizontal segment, starts. Then on here you take the derivative 
with respect to x. But since you have a constant added to an integral which depends only on x, the constant disappears, so it's zero, right? And what is left is the integral function, that is to say p of x. If you repeat the same argument used by using, but substituting the last segment, and you are allowed to do this because the integral does not depend on the choice of the path. You take as last segment in the polygonal path, for instance, a vertical segment. Again, you take whatever you want up to here as a path. You integrate, and this number here gives you a constant number. Then the last, the last contribution is just the contribution along the vertical line. So it depends only on one parameter of y. So you have a constant plus something which depends on y. So the first one depends on x. It's a constant. Second part depends on y, and the derivative with respect to y is just the integrand of this, the, second, the second function, because it depends, it's the integrative with respect to y. This is what I wanted to say. So um, now, it is natural to ask, well, well, this is something, OK, you have probably already seen in, in, in calculus courses in physics interpretation so this implies in particular this implies that the integral over a closed gamma sometimes is indicated in physics like this the circuitation right of p x y d x plus q x y d y is zero over gamma is closed curve, that is gamma of A is gamma of B. Which also means that the work I have to do to rise this rubber from here, okay, so the, the, the energy I have to spend, okay, is the same I've, or if I, okay. All right. So closed curve means, well, the starting point is then, why is it? Well, of course, because, well, you are <coughs> this is gamma of A equal to gamma of B. Take any point different from this to this point, take gamma of C. Huh? So imagine that you are running along, along this curve using this um, orientation. So then you have the integral from here to here, and then the integral from here to here. Correct? But then this is the opposite of the integral from here to here. You see this? So split the curve, the closed curve, the closed contour into two curves. They call it gamma one and gamma two. All right? So the integral over gamma 1 between gamma A and gamma C okay, is like the integral from gamma A to gamma C along this gamma 2, but you have to reverse the sign. Huh? That is to say, if you sum both, the integral is 0, because one is the opposite of the other. Same value, but different, different sign. And this is very important, OK? Now, the question is, the natural question, which can arise now if you are considering this is a course in complex analysis, well, how is this related to complex value functions? So this, uh, this is nothing but, well, uh, real analysis. Hmm? <coughs> and in fact, the question, natural question is when? The integral of this uh, does not depend on gamma, but only on the endpoints. In fact, if you uh, 
rewrite what we have here, we have actually P and Q written explicitly because remember that D of Z is dx plus i dy. So that <coughs> pxy is f of z and qxy is i f of z. Do you see this? In fact, this is the integral of f of z of dz or the integral of f of z dx plus i dy or the integral of f of z dx plus i f of z dy over gamma. And this is actually p, and this is q. As usual, I, with abusive notation, I say depending on x and y instead of depending on z, but there is this correspondence. Okay, so I have this. So the question is, when is it? Well, I have the answer. The answer is when when we have another function, u, the potential, such that uh, the answer is when there exists a function u such that u of x is f of z, in our case p, right? And u of y is i f of z, which is our q in this particular, for this particular choice of the form, right? But then u is, u is a complex value function. Assume that u is a plus ib, for instance. Hmm? Then you have that u of x is ax plus ibx. And u y is but we are saying that you see this two conditions imply that u of x is i u uh, is minus i, right? Or uh, yes, minus i u of y, correct? No. Uh, f of z times i, so i u of x is u of y. This is correct. That is i a of x minus b of x is i y plus i b of y. Or this and this are the same, and this and this are the same. That is to say, a of x is b of y, and i of y is minus b of x, which is easily seen to be, in fact, the condition, the Cauchy-Riemann equations for capital U. So the answer is yes. It is possible that the integral of a gamma of a complex value of f of z dz in dz huh, is independent of the curve gamma, but it depends only on the endpoints. Or if you want, if you take a closed gamma, a closed curve gamma, the integral is zero. But this is when there exists a potential which is holomorphic. So these are. Then u satisfies, as this equivalent, say that u satisfies Cauchy Riemann equations, and this means that u is holomorphic. Now, <coughs> rephrasing again, we can say, well, So the integral over a closed gamma, uh, closed curve gamma of f of z dz is zero if f is the derivative of a holomorphic function.
u. Do we have examples? Yes, we do have examples of functions which are derivative. We have the notion of derivation in complex sense. For instance, if I consider this function, as a function of z, a is given, n is given, is it true that considering the integral over gamma, gamma closed curve, this is zero? This is an exercise. Well, this is a basic example, but yes, the answer is yes, of course, um, until n is different from minus 1. Why? Well, because you see, this function here, the integrand, is in fact a derivative with respect to z. Well, we are just using standard rules of, so if you want, of derivation and integration, okay? And it is, well, 1 over n plus 1. That's why n has to be different from 0 of z minus a to the power n plus 1. Correct? So the integral is 0. So any potential, well, this is, of course, also for a equal to 0. We are done. Good. What if n is equal to minus 1? OK, this is maybe an, uh, the example we have to deal with. Yeah, but the logarithm function now is somehow not function. OK, first of all, I want to show you that the integral is not 0 over a closed curve, which means that you don't have a potential. OK, so take n equal to minus 1, so that, that is to say, we consider the function z minus a to minus 1, okay? This is holomorphic, yes, except for z equal to a, right? It's a well-defined, it cannot be even continuous so in a, so it's easily seen that it cannot, it cannot be holomorphic in a, right? Because we know that if it is complex differentiable, and it is also continuous there, like in a real case. Now take as gamma, the close gamma to be A plus R E I T, which is a circle centered at A of radius R. T, of course, varies between 0 and 2 pi. This is a closed curve. This is the closed curve. Considered in our consider in our example, so we have what we have a function defined in any point, but not at a, and we take a, as a curve, closed curve, a circle centered at a of radius r. There are very many, but take one. Okay, and I want to calculate the integral over gamma of one over z minus a dz. Correct? Which is the integral over so to two pi substitute. Okay, z is remember a plus r e i t. That is, dz is what? R, ri, eit, dt. What is z minus a? Well, is r, eit from here, right? Correct. So I have that at, we have to substitute dz, and then I have ri, eit, dt, and then consider R E I T E I T. R cancel R. R is of course positive, otherwise we are not considering a curve, right? E I T is not zero, so so what is left here is the integral of the T between zero to the pi with I in front. 
So it is 2 pi i, which is very far from being 0. So it's not always the case that you have a potential. But in several cases, you have a potential. Any, t any time you have a primitive function in the sense given before, that is to say, if you can find a holomorphic function whose derivative is the function under integration. Good. Now, the next task is to generalize, well, this previous example, the previous example, this example here, is not just by accident one example. If you remember, the very generic class of function we were considering were the class of function which are expressed in terms of power series expansions, right? And in the power series expansion, exactly this was one of the elements which appeared with a constant in front. But if this is zero, the constant is not a problem. So you can also prove that a n, z minus a n, is zero, right? Put an a n in front. The only difficult fact, well, if you have a polynomial, we are done. So if you have a finite power expansion which describes and defines the function, the uh, analytic function, well, it's fine. But when you have an infinite sum, well, you have contributions of infinite summons, which singularly are zero, but as you know, this is not sufficient to conclude that it is zero. And it will be actually true that if you start from a holomorphic function, okay, any holomorphic function is such that the integral of a closed curve is zero. The previous counterexample, if you want, is, is somehow the, the easiest counterexample, which is, a, which is in fact a, a function, not holomorphic in an entire plane, but an entire plane except from one point, and the curve is surrounding this point. All right? So, before considering a very generic case, let me just sketch you one Okay, one result, which is known under the name of Gursa theorem. And according to Alfors, uh, no uh, easiest uh, proof can be found in the entire complex analysis theory. So the, the theorem I want to prove is the Fortec F, holomorphic. in a rectangle, rectangle R. The rectangle <coughs> is a subset of C, all right, and includes also the signs, the edges, okay, of the, so it is an open set and can be the domain of definition of holomorphic function. But since we are considering also its edges, and we want to consider, in fact, the integral over R of f of z dz, we have at least to assume that f is continuous up to the boundary. But so with some lack of generality, we assume that f is continuous on the closed rectangle which means that, in fact, it is holomorphic in a small neighborhood of the rectangle itself. Hmm? Because remember, the definition of holomorphicity requires an open set. Okay? You have to have the possibility to calculate the, the, the derivative, so you have to move a little bit around the point. Okay? Correct. Now, I want to show that this is the case this is uh, a standard case. So the function, of, which is holomorphic of a, of a rectangle, guarantees that the, the integral of this rectangle is zero. How do we prove this? So this is Gursa's theorem. Well, first of all, let us indicate this. Okay, we have to prove this, right? Call 
this number, eta of r, is a complex number. We have to prove that this complex number is 0. And the method to prove it is by induction, in some sense, to, and using the bisection procedure, which is quite common and also in real analysis. So the observation is the following. When I calculate the integral over like, the, the rectangle, of course, I'm assuming that there is a verse you are running around this rectangle R. Okay, this, there is an orientation. So for instance, you start from here, move here, 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 because this is a closed curve. And this is a generic holomorphic function. So we are not assuming that f is specific. It's a generic. Now we are requiring some extra uh, hypothesis for the curve. The curve is a rectangle. It's a closed curve. Right? So the idea is the following. Cut the rectangle into four sub-rectangles by subdividing the edges. Half edge, half edge, OK, and then you have four rectangles, call, it, call them R1, R2, R3, and R4. And according to the orientation of the, the previous rectangle, we also orient the other one. As you can see, if I calculate the integral of the four rectangles, there's a contribution here, which coincides with the contribution of the big rectangle. Then a contribution here, which is canceled by the contribution along R3. Each in internal edges has a contribution of this positive, and the other is exactly the negative. The same here. Here is positive for R2, negative for R1. You see this? Correct. So that I can write that the integral of R of fz dz is the same as the integral of, of the same function over the four sub-rectangles. Are you with me? Because the only contribution which do not, do not cancel each other are the contribution on these sides here, so that the contribution of the edges of the previous, say, say of the starting rectangle. I'm saying previous because then the procedure, of course, explains you why we are now restricting and focusing on one rectangle and then going on. Because we have now this in a quad. So we take this. And this is smaller or equal of four times one, the, the integral of one of the rectangles. Okay? I don't know why. I don't know why, which one. But one of the rectangles is greater than the other. Sorry, one of the rectangles. One of the integrals is greater than the other. So I take this. And I have this inequality. OK, this is inequality. Take the modulus. This is smaller or equal to the sum of the moduli of the rectangles. But there is one which is bigger than the others. And I say four times the modulus of the larger rectangle. If there are two, OK, choose one. Okay? If they are all equal, OK, choose one. And then repeat the same procedure on this rectangle. Subdivide this rectangle into four small rectangles and repeat the argument. All right? So I say that this is R1, the first, but not because it is the first in this sense, in the subdivision, but it's the first in the procedure, right? And I can repeat it how many times I want, right? So I have a chain of rectangles, say R1, R2, Rn. Each one is including the previous one. And I have this in a quote, the integral of the starting rectangle 
is smaller or equal of, or 4 to the power n of the rectangle at, at the level n of the DC. Correct? So, each time this number is divided by 4. The previous inequality I had 4 here, then I repeat, repeat 4, 4, 4, 4, right? So, imagine that you have a length as you can, okay, zoom, and you see the same image every time, okay? At any scale, you repeat the same argument. You notice that, well, this is the length of the diagonal of the first rectangle, and the second step, the diagonal is one half. The, the edge is one half, the previous edge, and so on and so forth. What do we have? We have a net, if you want, huh, of, of rectangles, and, well, by decomposing this sequence, will eventually converge to a point inside the inside the, the rectangle okay okay so z naught is the limit of the sequence of j's Is it correct? So we are moving, but somehow reducing the 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 the, 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 the dimension of, of the rectangle we are considering up to a point. Hmm? Well, at this point, our function is holomorphic, right? Because it is inside. Well, z naught is in R. It's a complex set, so it, okay, it's a closed set in particular. Good. <coughs> what does it mean? It means that well, we can uh, uh, we can take f of z minus f of z naught over z minus z naught for z in, in R. Okay, and we know that this is very close to f prime of z naught if c minus z naught is smaller than delta huh? because the function is holomorphic you can also rewrite this inequality in this way the square modulus of f of z minus modulus of z naught minus f prime z naught times z minus z naught is smaller epsilon times Now, <clears throat> what is number 18, 20? I observe that the integral over R of f of z dz is modulus. Right? Was it modulus or I don't remember if I put modulus, maybe modulus, right? More precisely. Huh? And then I have also this to be the integral of Rj. Now, from this, from the previous inequality, also have that the integral of this stuff is 
small or equal of the inter epsilon integral of z minus e naught. Yes, minus yeah. I mean, yes, correct. All right. This is done with respect to z dz. Correct. So I calculate this over. More precisely, I would have chosen this notation, probably drn. All right, not inside it, but well, r is the entire domain, and the the, the edges are drn. Right. So, means along along the contour. Okay. Well, this does not give you any contribution to the integral because we know this is zero. This is a constant. Don't, don't uh, be uh, worried about f prime. This is a number. This is a constant, and this is, well, just because of the previous example, just z minus z naught to the power one, if you want. So it has a primitive function, and the integral is zero. And similarly, also, the integral of a constant is zero, hmm? because you have a, always a primitive of a constant. So, <clears throat> and I want to finish, but I'm running my time. I'm over my time, 21. Okay. So I have that on the one on the one side I have the integral and this after some consideration is greater of the modulus of Of this, right? Uh, this. this number here, well, <coughs> if you think of z naught is here, and I have this is Rn, so I have z running around here, right? So this number here is at most. the n, the diagonal, the largest distance between two points on the boundary is the n. So this is smaller or equal to. And then I have, if, well, if I replace this by the n, then I have all just the integral over the, the boundary of our n. So this is Ln, well, Ln is the sum of the length of the edges, right? But look, every time when I subdivide and I cut the starting the, the, the rectangle into four small rectangles, the edges, the, the length of each edge is the one half of the previous one. And similarly, also the diagonal. So at stage n, you have, if d is the diagonal of r of the starting rectangle, dn is d over 2 to the power n. And ln, the sum of the edges, is similarly l over 2 power n. Right? So I have, and this concludes the proof, I guess this is 21. 
and this is I have epsilon ln the n <coughs> greater or equal to epsilon integral over rn c minus z naught dz is greater or equal to integral of drn of fc dz modulus and this is remember is the integral eta r over 4 to the power n remember the nth integral then this is d over 2n and this is l over 2n right in other words i have epsilon dl over 4 to the power n is greater or equal to eta r 4 to the power n and since uh, epsilon is taken as small as we want we conclude that this number here is zero okay because these are two finite numbers and epsilon can be taken as small as we want this is the only possibility so we conclude that in fact for special curves closed curve the contour of a rectangle the fact that f is holomorphic in the rectangle guarantees that the integral over this contour is zero. All right? And I stop here for today. Thank you, and sorry for the delay.